Hey, happy Thursday again. I'm Bob Krell, uh, founder and publisher of Healthy Indoors Magazine. And uh, hey, thanks for being with us again today. Uh, another great show. Super excited. Uh, our guest today um, has a wealth of knowledge, lots of experience in the industry on a varied, uh, varied set of areas. So we'll, we'll get into that shortly. Um, just want to talk a little bit about um, what you're doing here. Um, Healthy Indoors Magazine um, is uh, is our prominent, uh, you know, uh, I should say our, our our prominent vehicle of how we communicate. But of course, a lot of stuff happens on our Healthy Indoors online global community uh, as well, which is where many of you may be watching the show today. Um, certainly, we have a lot of that ungated out open to the general public, but we have so much more available to those who are members of the uh, community. Uh, we just recently this Tuesday launched our AMA, our Ask Me Anything series. Uh, Cole Stanton was our first uh, guest and uh, we had a great uh, uh, Q and A session with him uh, this past Tuesday. That's available to uh, community members. You can uh, actually watch the recordings of that. And we'll be doing that on a monthly basis. Um, so we're pretty excited about it. Um, again, you can learn more about uh, how how to get on the Healthy Indoors community at global.healthyindoors.com. That's where that's located. So we'll be right back uh, with our guest right after uh, this word. <laughs> So for over 29 years, Derek Tenay has provided professional environmental consulting and industrial hygiene services. Um, Derek has uh, worked as both environmental consultant and remediation uh, work across the United States. Uh, he holds or has held numerous industry relevant certifications. Uh, he has contracted, manages, managed, and uh, performed over 20,000 indoor environmental uh, projects. Um, qu quite a quite a large number, quite frankly. So, um, you know, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Derek to the show. Hey, buddy, how are you? Bob Krell, the man, the myth, the uh, legend. How are you, sir? You know what? I I'm doing well. You know, and and uh, you look you look fabulous as always. I mean, you're in a you nice. Mean my you know, beard is great. You can say. Well, it. you're yeah. Well, my beard is great too. <laughs> that's why I don't grow it anymore. You know, I, I used to wear the goatee thing years ago when it was dark. Uh, but now it's a dead giveaway of my, uh, you know, many years on the planet. So I, um, that, that's the wisdom. same reason I shaved the sides, too, because it's, it's almost wisdom. white. <laughs> you no, know, when I was 22 years old in this industry, I went into a meeting and told these folks in a conference room, I said, here's your problem. And to fix it, you need to do A, B and C. And they looked at me and basically just outright ignored what I had to say. So I went in the hall and I got my assistant who happened to have a gray beard. And I said, uh, I just told these fine gentlemen that this is their problem and to fix it, they need to do A, B, and C. What do you think? And my assistant with the gray beard went, yup. And they sprung into action. And I said, I have got to get a gray beard. So I've spent 30 years working on it. And uh, now people believe me, whether it's justified or not, they tend to believe, well, that guy must know what he's talking about. So you really just invest the time to get the gray beard. It just takes a while to get it. <laughs> <laughs> That is the best way I've ever heard that put in my entire life. That's hysterical, buddy. I love it. But I mean, so, so you've had like just a ton of experience in a lot of areas in the indoor environmental, you know, business. I mean, you know, asbestos, lead, mold, uh, you know, you dealt with, you know, this past pandemic with COVID, but, you know, and, and many more things, you know. Um, the hot so, ticket right now, the hot item is, uh, pardon the pun, but it's lithium battery fires. So okay. I think that people, are, uh, you know, industrial hygienists, indoor environmental quality consultants need to really uh, bone up on lithium battery fires because they are significant. They are going to be more and more common as we put larger uh, batteries on the road and in buildings. And it has some nuances that you need to know. All environmental issues obviously have the same uh, framework, right? What is the hazard? How do I protect people? Uh, but there are some nuances to lithium battery fires. I think people should start to bone up on if you're looking for the new, again, hot item. And and is that is that happening a lot in the indoor environment, or is that like uh, you're thinking in terms of outdoor environmental? Because you do outdoor environmental work as well, right? Not just indoor. Predominantly, we do indoor environmental work, but we do okay. support the outdoor environment. So yeah, there are you know there are lithium batteries in your phone. There are lithium batteries in your um, your drill. 
there are lithium batteries in your vehicle, your electric vehicle, but there are also buildings filled with lithium ion batteries to supplement the power grid, for example. And, um, you know, what's interesting about lithium batteries is they produce their own oxygen for all intents and purposes. So you can stick them underwater once they're in thermal runaway and they continue to, uh, to burn, if you will. So how are you going to address that? What things are being emitted? How do you protect people from those things, both during the emergent event and of course, after the smoke has cleared, quote unquote. So, and they emit a lot of toxins in, in, in the event of a lithium battery fire. There's just a lot of bad stuff coming off of those, right? Yeah, combustion byproducts in general are bad. You know, I was once approached during, uh, you know, you've heard of Prop 65 in California. It's the everything contains cancer law. So I was <laughs> I was approached by uh, when I, by the company I work with. We were approached uh, to prove that burning a, um, a manufactured log uh, produced carcinogens. And I said, hold up the phone. I go, yeah, burning stuff produces carcinogens. Um, smoke is bad. You know, uh, you, that's why we leave buildings that are on fire. That's one of the reasons we leave building on fire. Obviously, burning to death is also a reason, but it's the emissions that are being uh, pushed out that are bad. So it was funny to have to design an experiment and actually collect data to show that burning a, a log made of wax, uh, diesel fuel, if you will, and uh, compressed sawdust right. produced carcinogens when you set it on fire. It was funny. I mean, it wasn't funny, but, but it was it, an interesting it, it, question. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting that you would even have to uh, broach that. It, I mean, it seems almost intuitive that, of course, it, of course it does. Yeah. It's not a surprise, well, not a surprise right? Yeah. But, you know, when a lawyer asks you to do something, they have some you know, uh, motive to do so. And they needed that data to achieve whatever mission they were trying to achieve. But um, yeah, so we I've been very blessed, Bob, seriously, to, to have a diverse uh, career. You know, I have a degree in environmental science. I grew up in Oklahoma and there was no environmental work uh, when I graduated from college. All the oil field work was gone and that was most of the environment. What year did you graduate? I have to ask. I'm, I'm going to date you now. Okay, 1990. I got okay. my degree in 1990. Okay. Uh, four. I'm sorry, 1994, uh, and high school in 1990. Um, but yeah, so I couldn't find a job, and of course, this is before the internet, right? So I relied on personal networks and uh, got my first job in Huntington Beach, California. So I packed everything I own um, and moved to Huntington Beach, California, to work in the indoor air quality field. My first, my first gig, and uh, you know, my employer immediately gave me a bag of goodies and said, go, uh, go observe, go monitor this fireproofing removal that contains asbestos. So I went to this hospital and they had built this fancy false ceiling and I walked into the decon and none of the workers spoke English. And so it was immediately uh, there was a, a surprise I wasn't prepared for was I couldn't communicate well with the people I was uh, on the site with, but, they put on their suit, I put on my suit. They put on their boots, I put on my boots. They put on their gloves, I put on my gloves. I'm watching them, I'm emulating. They put on their PAPR, powered air purifying respirator, as you know. Um, connect the battery, turn it on, and then they climb up the ladder and they go across the ceiling, over the ducts and under the sprinkler lines and get to this area where they're scraping uh, acoustic, I'm uh, sorry, asbestos um, off the fireproof, uh, sorry, off the I-beams, asbestos okay. fireproofing off these I-beams. And then one of the guys looks at me and he says, Mira, no filtro. I said, what? No filtro. So I had put on the PAPR. I turned it on. The motor was running, but I did not put a filter on. She just had a fan. So you basically were like really wolfing it right in your face. Yeah. And that is one of the main reasons. Like right now, fit testing is a big deal for, um, you know, N95 wearers uh, because of COVID. But I take... Uh, training very seriously. You can't hand somebody a safety device uh, and just set them loose because, you know, I could have injured myself day one of my environmental career because I did not get a proper training in my PPE. Um, so, you know, let that be a lesson to you young people. Don't go out there with PPE that you don't know how to use. But I was just new and they said, go forth and do good things. Um, but yeah, so... 
That's huge, though. I mean, that, that's that's a huge point, Derek. I mean, and, and you have to keep retrading. That was what, you know, for many years, I ran, ran a contracting, you know, an environmental contracting company. And we had all the right equipment, trained everybody properly initially, you know, tried to have supervisors always stay on top of everything. And inevitably, anytime I would walk onto a job site, somebody would be doing something stupid. Yeah. Even though they've been trained not that. to, or just, you know, like they got all the, all the ladder denominations you could ever want in the staging area, you know, six, eight, you know, 10, 12, you know, every type of, every type of safety rig, retractor harnesses, you know, everything's set up to, to do things right. And it's like, and then you find some clown standing on top of a six foot ladder. Yeah. You know, it's like. It's sad. I mean, uh, you know. What's sad I, because I they're, they're taking, they're putting themselves at risk, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah, it's just stuff is my theme. You know, you can have all the safety gear, the cool the Gucci respirators and all that stuff. Uh, not to not Gucci, but, but uh, or plug Gucci, whichever you prefer that to be. But, um, but yeah, you can have all of the stuff. But if you don't know how to use it and you don't know how to use it under stress, you know, I, I carry two tourniquets with me everywhere I go. And I train to put those tourniquets on under stress. Um you know, having tourniquets, people think, ah, you're crazy. What are you planning for the apocalypse? You know what? There's a pretty good chance someone's going to get a, a, a significant cut on a project that we're on. And I want to be able to stop that bleeding as quickly as I can uh, so that they have a better chance of survival. But just having um, tourniquets doesn't make me able to execute. And so you have to practice. So training and practice with any tool, any safety tool is is critically important. I have dedicated my life to this, right? So I mm -hmm. really push hard to help people be ready for uh, the foreseeable emergencies, but also the unforeseeable emergencies, you know? If you had a good infection control program at your facility, when COVID came, you were way ahead of the curve. Absolutely. It, nobody had a COVID, um, you know, a COVID plan, but they had an emergent uh, infectious agent plan. And if they, had practiced that, it was night and day. We, I went to many hundreds of facilities where people were obviously very sick and many people dying. And the ones that had done planning, had done the tabletop exercises, not even, not even drills, but just tabletop exercises. They knew one another. They knew what assets they had on hand. They understood their, their building and they were able to reduce risk. I mean, we're not in the risk prevention business. We're in right. the risk reduction business but there was a dramatic reduction in the people who were what i call prepared you know i'm an eagle scout sure my license plate says be prepared um i try to live my life in that way um you can't prepare for every eventuality but a failure to prepare really sets you back um when something happens that's either uh, expected or unexpected so. Well, I mean, that's especially true under stress, right? Uh, you know, in a, in a stressful situation, if you haven't trained to be able to at least, you know, execute all the steps of whatever it is, whatever process it is, just under normal circumstances, there's no chance in the hell you're going to be able to do it under stress if if, if everything goes nuts. Not going to so, happen. Yeah, uh, and these emergencies is, never happen, right? They never happen on a Tuesday at noon. Right. They happen on a Friday. They, they would happen tonight at 3 a.m. because it's a three-day weekend. So tonight at 3 a.m., I expect to get a call. The wheels have fallen off somebody's bus and mm -hmm. people are at risk and the managers are in Hawaii on vacation. And they should be on vacation. But the point is the facility has to practice without having daylight, without having the resources they could get during the day, without having the management uh, capacity, um, you know, because people are often gone and uh yeah, but it's a it's an interesting field that we've chosen, Bob. It's a very interesting field. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, I, and again, I you know, you got into it. You didn't pre-plan that you were going to be in indoor environmental work, right? That was never part of your life plan going into it. So I have what to... I call I call a hero complex, Bob. So I I want to help people. It gives me joy to 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 help people, uh, either to prevent something bad from happening or to help them when something bad is happening. The prevention side obviously is the goal, but Sure. You and I know that people don't Sometimes. often uh, plan the prevention side. So um, I wanted to be a physician, I thought, and I worked in a dentist's office when I was a kid to see what that would be like to work in a clinical setting. And I didn't like it, but I still wanted to help people. And I love science. So I thought, you know, if I went to the environmental field, I could help people maybe that I never even have to meet. You know, if you're a doctor, you have to meet the patient to help them. But if you're 
examining a building and you find there are you know, deficiencies or opportunities for improvement, you pick your uh, half full, half empty, right? Um, you could fix that. You could help the management fix that. You're protecting people that you never meet. And not just the people in the building today, but the people that will come to the building in the future. And so for me, that's very rewarding. Um, and so I knew I wanted to be in a field that did something like that. Um, indoor air quality wasn't exactly, uh, you know, uh, I didn't laser focus to get there, but it worked out. And I'm really happy. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a minute. It's almost 30 years now. I've been doing this. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny how quick that goes by. For me, it's actually, oh my goodness, like over 35 now, which you're entering 35, which, yeah, it, it went fast, right? I mean, right. It, it's it's hard to figure. Um, so, you know, one of the things, you know, you mentioned about your, your hero complex and helping. You've done a lot of volunteer work with various trade groups, trade organizations, you know, and other things too, obviously. But, you know, let, let's talk a little bit to what you've done. You know, you, you've served on the board of directors of the Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA, for many years. Uh, were you on the board of EIA as well? Or I, I know you've worked. I've been on the board there. of directors of the EIA uh, Arizona group. I have been on the uh, advisory board for ACAC, which at the time was the American Indoor Air Quality Council. So I've, uh, I've injected myself into those groups, um, not because I think my opinion is better than other people, but I I feel like if you don't get involved, you have no room to complain. Um, you want to have, you only have a certain amount of sway in your life and you want to use that to make things better, um, uh, to be involved is, is I think is important. Uh, and then you meet people and, uh, you know, even if it's just from a, a strict business standpoint, you know, some people say, I don't have time to be involved in these trade organizations. I would say, well, do you have time to meet your next client or the next person who will refer you to your next client? Because, you know, these, any industry you're in is not that big. Uh, word spreads, word of mouth. And a, and a warm referral is gold. If, if you told somebody, um, hey, you need to use Derek for this problem you're having, the vetting is done. They're going to call and now right. it's, just a, it's just a matter of when are we coming out to help you. Um, so from that, it's great. And then you learn, you know, I, it's important. I'll tell you a funny story. I don't know, maybe you won't think it's funny, but I was doing a project in Flagstaff. So I'm based in Phoenix. It's really hot most of the time in Phoenix. And so I went to this project in Flagstaff, which is up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm looking at this door and it has water damage on both sides of the, of the door jam at the bottom of the door, but it's got a covered porch and there's no indication that rain could possibly get to this location. It's sloped well. It's, and the realtor just kind of gave me a nudge and goes, Hey man, snow drift. And I was like, snow, it's not on my radar. So oh, yeah, it's yeah. important to meet people from around the world. In fact, IAQA has given me opportunity to teach in, India and Singapore, but it's important to meet people in other places that have different types of buildings, different problems or similar problems, but maybe at a higher rate. You know, we don't have to deal with humidity like people in Florida do. But if you don't know humidity, you're not a very good uh, indoor environmental quality professional. So you want to talk to people who that's their that's their cross to bear. Right. The humidity cross is what you bear when you work in Florida. Um, here we have the heat cross, right? We, we, we deal with the heat, but there's, um, you know, it's important if you're involved in these organizations, one, you're making a difference Two, mm -hmm. you're meeting people who can help you with your career. And three, you're constantly learning. Um, and if you're not constantly learning, you're, you're going to get left behind. You're not going to provide the best service to your customer. Yeah. Your educate, your professional education is an ongoing process. Nobody, you're, you're not all learned yet. You know, you, you never get there. Um, that's at that point when you stop learning, you really pretty much stop growing. You know, you're, you're not, you're not moving. Um, we met actually at, I think the first time, I believe at the American indoor air quality council, Phoenix chapter meeting years and years ago. Uh, I mean, we may have met before that at some other function, but it was probably in 2000. Wow. I mean, that, that we actually interacted, you know, it's like, I think Charlie Wiles brought me out there. I actually spoke at the luncheon, you know, at, at the chapter meeting. Uh, it was downtown Phoenix. I can't remember some hotel. Can't remember where, right. but it was, yeah. Wow. So it's, yeah, it's, small, it's, it's, it's a small world. <laughs> it, is, it is. It is a small world. Yeah. 
So, um, you know, again, you've, you've spent a lot of time working with these organizations and, you know, obviously, I mean, and I did too, back in my, you know, early days of my career, I spent a lot with NADCA. I mean, I was on that board for 11 years and, 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 you know, chaired a lot of committees and, and spent a lot of time doing a lot of, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteer hours that helped me learn a lot more, got, got me a lot more opportunity, you know, to interact with people and, 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 and yes, it, certainly made contacts. No question about it. You know, I mean, it's, it's not to say it's self-serving. You're not doing it to be self-serving, but you know, it, it's still, there's, there's benefits to being involved in, in working in an organization, I believe. Sure. No and doubt. there are other organizations that are even not air quality related. You know, I, sure. I work with the California Association of Healthcare Facilities, the Arizona Healthcare Association. There's, um, you know, there's many trade organizations that you can become involved in that are ancillary or you know, uh, to, to IAQ related work, but they need professionals with your expertise. So if there's a young person starting in this field, I would certainly recommend they, they look, you know, you can't do it all at once. You know, it's not fair to compare you and I, someone who's just starting out because we've had years and years to, to look at these opportunities and, and move in and out of different organizations. Start right now doing something in a trade organization would be, I think, foolish for your career long term. Oh, I I, I, t I totally agree with that. So yeah, and I'm I'm putting up Clark Safe Clark um, <laughs> because that's that's where you've spent a lot of your time, you know, with that. And I you know I noticed in your CV that you've got you know, tw and I mentioned this twenty thousand indoor environmental projects. Wow, I mean that's like and, and varied, right? Uh, you know, asbestos, you know, across the across the gamut, really, right? Yeah, um, asbestos, lead, mold, anthrax, ricin, lead paint, sewage incursion. What's that smell? Carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, you know, it's a it's a pretty diverse. You know, there are lots of people who just focus on one thing, and that's fine. Uh, if you just want to do asbestos inspections, be the best damn asbestos inspector sure. you can be. Um, you know, for us, asbestos inspection is just a part of every job. If we go to a meth lab. We check for asbestos. If we go to a trauma scene or unintended death, we check for asbestos. If it's a mercury spill, we're checking for asbestos. So, uh, I think it's important for our clients uh, so that that we that we have that diversity. Uh, so I don't have to send an asbestos inspector and a lead inspector and then somebody who can handle the biohazard issue. We want to be multi lines ex experts. Um, that's great uh, for also employee retention. It keeps people constantly learning. Um, it's always challenging. You know, you're, it's never the, it's never Groundhog Day in our office. I'm sure it's the same in your office, right? It's never Groundhog Day. When the phone rings, no, I have it, no idea what's going to be. It's just, all, it's just always it's crazy day in my office though. You know, it's like, you see, never, I, I, I'm, my office, my life is more like Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. You know, it's like, I, I have different hats on every day. You know, I'm a video producer, show host one day, you know, uh, industry magazine publisher another day, indoor environmental consultant another day. Still, do, I still get involved with commercial air duct cleaning. So I'm still involved with, okay. with actual contracting work, you know, so, and, you know, and then there's life, you know, your, your outside life, you know, everybody has some interest. So yeah, it's a, every day is a little different. But it's good. We have a good team. And I work with Clark Safe Clark, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. with your graphic there. And we have a team of, you know, we have chemists, microbiologists, mycologists, uh, engineers, just a, a very diverse group of folks. And that allows us to pick a team. You know, when a client calls with a problem or a question, we put a team together of the right experts to handle that. Because even though I may have expertise in a lot of things, we actually have a chemist. And, that, and I have expertise in a lot of things, but I actually have a mycologist on the team. So, you know, we uh, we gauge what's needed uh, based on the needs of the client. That's really nice to have that that team approach. And, uh, you know, Clark Safe Clark's been a good place for me to, to hang my hat for God, 22 years now. Crazy. But um it, it time goes by fast. I mean, I, you know, I've, I started my, my initial company. Well, I, I started with somebody else in 86 when I got into the industry. I, and, uh, and then in 1990, I started IAQ technologies. Um, and that was, you know, look how, 32 years ago, wow. that went fast, <laughs> went super fast. Well, so, so you're, you're, you've got a, you've got a new, uh, 
you know, a, a new uh, initiative that you're working on and, uh, you know, sewer gas solutions, which you mentioned to me, you, you, this has been in the works for a few years and uh, I'm going to let you describe it because I'll butcher it, but it's like, bottom line is there's a lot of issues with, uh, with dr dried out drains, putting odors in spaces. All of us in the IAQ space at one time or another, if not on a regular basis, have been brought in to an issue of some odors in spaces and sewer gas related. So, you know, tell us more about this. So uh, many years ago, I went to a hospital evacuation. You know, so I got a call at three in the morning and they said, we have a natural gas leak and we can't find it. We've evacuated the hospital and we need your help. This gas company's here. The fire department's here. The you know facility owner and building engineers are all here scratching their head and we can't go back in the building. So somebody figures out what's going on and we can't find it. And I said, OK, well, let me gather up an assistant and get all of our whiz bang equipment and come on out and see if we can help you. You know, you never know if you're going to be able to help somebody or not. And I try not to set the expectation too high. But certainly if it's an air quality problem, we're, we're, we're the best qualified to find it uh, would be my, you know, my pitch. Uh, so we show up and sure enough, there's patients on ventilators out in the parking lot. Now it's winter, but it's a Phoenix winter. So it's not like a Buffalo, Buffalo New York winter. But, you know, if you're on a ventilator, you want to be out in the parking lot. Right. Uh, you don't want your your brother or your mother or your wife on a ventilator out in the parking lot, you know, and uh, I always take my job seriously, but that night I was like, we better get this figured out. Right. So um, we put all the meters on a cart, push it in the building, pull it out. Everything checks out. We kind of go room by room, zone by zone. And within just about 10 minutes, I'm using a, just a simple tool, which is a smoke pencil. And I'm smoking this, this floor drain and, and air is rushing out of this four inch floor drain. I mean, it's pushing up at a pretty, pretty high rate. And uh, it, and the odor I detect is consistent with sewer gas, although sewer gas doesn't always smell like poo. Right. It can have right, varied right. odors because it depends on what's in the drain and uh, what's upstream and downstream of your of your building. But um, so I gather, you know, the the gas company representatives and the fire department and everybody in a big circle around me. and I smoke the drain and you can see the smoke just rush up out of the right. floor and then i take a pitcher of water and i pour it in the drain and then i smoke it again and the smoke just hovers and i said that'll be five thousand dollars there you okay. go <laughs> uh, but uh immediately the owner of the hospital fired two career facility guys uh guys with mortgages and kids and uh i don't know that that was fair because whose job is it to fill the drain? Is it the trap primer's job? Is it the custodian's job? Is it the building engineer's job? I don't want to get into all that, but what I realized that night and, and having done many projects before that, finding that, Hey, you got to put water in that toilet, sir. Hey, you got to put water in that sink. That's why you have bad smells. That's why you have roaches coming in the building unchecked or sewer flies. That's why your eyes and your nose are burning. Um, you know, sewer gas is combustible as well. Sure. And, you know, and sewer gas contains sulfur compounds. You know, methylmercaptan is the additive to natural gas. So natural gas has no smell. Um, and we add methylmercaptan to it so that you can detect it at low concentrations. And so because sewer gas contains methylmercaptan, very common for people to think they have a natural gas leak. Now, you can have a natural gas leak. Not all, you know, methylmercaptan smells are sewer gas, but it certainly needs to be on your radar. And then lastly, sewer gas contains, you know, hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, ammonia, water vapor, all things that cause corrosion. And we have seen fire alarms, fire panels, mirrors, you know, plumbing fixtures corrode mm -hmm. to such a degree that they fail. Cooling coils will fail. Water pipes will rupture. Um, fire panels will, will either not alarm when they need to, which is very scary, or they'll alarm falsely, which is also scary because now you're moving people. You know, I do a lot of work in vulnerable populations. And when you move people that are nearing the end of their, you know, their journey, um, you know, a high percentage of them, sometimes up to 30% will die just because of the stress of the move. So I said, there's got to be a way, there's got to be a fix to this, such a common problem, vacant homes, you know, realtors have vacant homes that they're trying to sell. Nobody wants to buy a stinky house. No. Um, 
property managers, commercial property managers that have vacant suites. And we've been to so many where the, you know, the sewer gas comes in to vacant suite A. And then because air moves, because everybody has penetrations in their firewalls, which they shouldn't, but they do, uh, you know, they'll get that sewer gas uh, traveling into adjacent suites. So I said, there's got to be a way. So I got one of the, one of my partners, Paul Anderson, is a chemist. Uh, I've known him. We actually went to college together, uh, undergrad. And so he, um, he and I worked on finding a solution. We started with mechanical things, but mechanical things require an installation and there's many different kinds of pipes. And so um, that wasn't working. So we thought there's got to be a solution. By solution, I mean something you can pour in the drain that will keep that water from evaporating or supplant the water. We weren't sure at the time. So after nine years of research and development <laughs> and my garage looking like a scene out of Breaking Bad with mock-up pea traps and uh, jars of goo, um, we came up with the, the right solution. We submitted our patent and I got word this last month that we are going to get our non-provisional patent for sewer gas solutions. And that is just a product that you fill your trap with water, regardless if it's in a freezer, if it's in a walk-in cooler, if it's in your house or a commercial building or your garage in a Phoenix summer. You pour the you pour you fill the trap with water, you pour the solution in, and it's an evaporation engine. It creates a barrier at the top of the uh, of the water um, so that that trap won't dry. And I think. For, for the benefit of some people who don't know, the only thing that separates the living space from the sewer is that water in that U-shaped pipe that's often called a P-trap or a trap. There's different terminology, but mm -hmm. you know everyone that's on this call, everyone that's watching this program has looked under a sink sometime in their life and seen that U-shaped pipe. What they may not realize is that U-shaped pipe is also under your tub and behind your washing machine in the wall. Um, and under your shower and even your toilet has a even, trap. Yeah, a toilet for that matter. So if you pour our product on and cover the surface of the water, it won't let the water evaporate for up to a year. Now we tell people three to six months, but, uh, and what's great about the product is again, we spent years working on this. So I can tell you 10,000 things that don't work. And I can tell you some things that work, but you don't want to use because they're flammable or they cross react with bleach when somebody pours it down the drain or they congeal or they damage the pipe or they stain the toilet or they grow bugs or they grow, uh, you know, microorganisms. So we came up with the right solution. To, you know, I call it the magic goo. I can give you more information if you want, but essentially um, it checks all the boxes. You could drink it. It would give you diarrhea, gastrointestinal right. distress, but you could drink it and not I'll take die. your word for that. I'm not going to, you know. Um, it actually smells good. Um, and then um, it's not damaging to your skin. Um, so it's it, it, it really is, you know, I don't want to say miracle product because that's, you know, that's overselling. No, but, but it, it seems like a, it, it, like it's a very... Um, I'm going to say simple solution, but I'm not trying to minimize because it it's really hard to come up with the right, you know, ke chemical to, to do this with. But I mean, the premise is that you're coming up with something that stops the evaporation. You know, I mean, yeah. so, it's, it's, it, an it's, elegant. A, it's an elegant solution to a complex problem that doesn't seem that complex. But uh, we've tried over the years, you know, baby oil, different things, and nothing works very well. The other thing, too, is you're in a climate in the Southwest where you're in cooling mode probably all year round, right? So you're yeah, always. So your condensate drains off your mechanical equipment or, you know, your traps, there are probably always having moisture come out. But here in the Northeast, for example, when we get into the, uh, you know, the heating months, we dry the traps out on all our mechanical equipment. Now you backdraft sewer gas in the mechanical system. All That's right. Well, That's that right. a lot. Yeah. A lot of people don't know there's a P trap on your condensate line. They're supposed uh, to be. <laughs> Yeah, they're supposed to be. Exactly. I mean, it's not always. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's really, uh, you know, the, the key is, it, I mean, uh, you know, I tell people, look, you don't need our product because all you have to do is go around and fill up all your plumbing fixtures with water on a regular basis. In Phoenix, that's once a week, especially in the summer. Um, but that takes a lot of effort, and somebody's got to remember to do it. And we know that, you know, labor is scarce and expensive. and 
So with this product, um, you can kind of set it and forget it, if you will. Um, so yeah, it's been good. I mean, even, you know, we have snowbirds here in Arizona and we would get calls from pest control companies saying that these uh, people who are coming back to their home after being away for the summer, uh, their homes are filled with roaches and they will, and the, the owners wanted, you know, a significant amount of pesticides applied. And the pest control companies were, you know, saying we don't feel comfortable doing that. Uh, we think there's a reason that these bugs are coming in. And I said, yeah, it's because the traps are dry and you have an unfettered access to the living space from the sewer. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good product. Uh, it's inexpensive. You don't need it on the traps you're using. Some people will ask if you pour it on one side of the trap, if you want to bring the graphic back up, um, you'll see there's two sides to the trap. There's the room side or the sink side, right? And then there's the sewer side. And you really only need the goo, uh, the sewer gas solution on the sink side. If you run the sink a few times, some will flush through and eventually you flush it out. So there's no, you don't have to do anything once you start using that sink again. But the, uh, the evaporation and condensation on the, on the sewer side of the trap is, is kind of an equilibrium. So you're not losing water to that side. You lose water to the room side. And as you mentioned in Phoenix, because we're running our air conditioners all the time, one, we have low humidity in general. Mm -hmm. Two, air conditioners, you know, cool and dehumidify air and they move air. And that air movement of very dry air dries our traps just like that. And, uh, you know, we're using the sink example, but it's the same thing for the tub or the shower or the toilet. Um, most people recognize the toilet because it's a visual. You can see the toilet water level has dropped. Yeah, but, but if you think about it, though, Derek, you know, not not necessarily like in an area that's like not used very often. You know, like maybe you know you have a bathroom in a basement in a property, and people aren't going in there. You know, and I'll be honest with you, we have. I'm saying this from personal experience. We have we have the fourth bathroom in our house down in the basement that never gets used. Like literally, doesn't get used for you know months on months. end yeah. and, and and i've walked down there on more than one occasion and walked in and found the bowl dry wow well i, I know a product Bob. I can, yeah 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 uh, refer you to yeah so we were lucky that we got sewergassolutions.com is the website uh, i didn't think we would get a sewer gas themed website but we uh we were lucky and that was not taken so uh, and people can order it online. Um, once we get our patent, I'd like to license it to someone who makes products on a grander scale. Right now, we're making it in, you know, 500 gallon batches in my commercial building here in Phoenix. It's um, gotten away from the Walter White uh, manufacturing, at least. That was just yeah, for the yeah. beta. That was for the beta version. Well, and it's expensive. I mean, I'm, listen, I'm an environmental consultant. I'm not a manufacturer. Right. And when we were trying to find the right combination of goo. You know, we had to buy stuff. And when you buy stuff in bottles like this per ounce, it's expensive. And so the first batch we made was 60 bucks a gallon to make. Um, but when you buy it in 55 gallon drums or thousand gallon, you know, containers, the price per unit comes way, way down. Uh, so, um, but I think someone who makes it professionally and distributes it professionally will, will have a better better success you know we just want to we just want to solve the problem you know what like is I that said, retailing at now I, I have to ask the question because we have <laughs> actually one of the question on the community on that oh it's 38 dollars for a bottle a bottle will do about 36 oh so that's quite a few okay you know if you bought if you bought a bottle and you were a realtor you could do a couple of houses with it um you know so it's not expensive um mm -hmm. that's our pricing i'm assuming if someone licenses it they may charge more but you know, that's yeah. up to them. It's, but, it's um, capitalism. <laughs> but yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it works. It solves, you know, we are in the business of solving problems, Bob. Absolutely. I mean, for 35 years, that's what you've done. For 30 years, that's what I've done. Yeah. We don't know anything different. So no, this that's... is just one more tool in people's toolbox. Um, now, obviously, it's self-serving because I invented it. It's our patent, Paul and I, Paul Anderson and I. Uh, it's our company, but um, but I'm proud that it solves this problem because, again, I don't want to see any more hospitals evacuated when they don't have to be. You yeah. Know? 
it's it, it, it's 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 a, a simple fix that seems like it's a, it's a really great idea. So so I'm 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 going to move on to we got a, a question uh, for you. Awesome. Uh, how has the IAQ market changed since you started? Since you know you, you've you've been here thirty uh -huh. years, you know what what's changed? It's great, great question. So I'll give you a couple of different variations. The first one is it's cyclical. Um, when I first got into the business, asbestos was the hot topic. So asbestos went up like a rocket ship and then came down. You know, it was uh, 250 bucks for a TEM and now you can get them for 60. Um, you were waiting three weeks for a TEM. Now you can get them same day. So asbestos wave, uh, lead based paint wave, phase one environmental site assessment wave, mold wave, COVID wave. Right. So. There's always a flavor of the month that's coming in strong and people are going to jump on that bandwagon. And that's both good and bad because people who dedicate their lives to this industry uh, get a lot of work. But you also have all these uh, fly by night people who are trying to take advantage of the situation, folks coming in. But so one is cyclical Two, the technology is off the chart. You know, I mean, I used to carry milk crates in the trunk of my car filled with standards. Now everything is a, everything's on your phone. We used to take pictures, anything that was important, you'd take three 35 millimeter pictures of because you didn't know when you developed that film and then glued that picture into your report if it was gonna be a good shot or not. Now you have your camera, the camera takes amazing photos, right? We used to print blueprints and mail them to everybody that's in the project and then they would mark them up by hand and uh, mail them back to the draftsman, drafts person. Oh boy, I gotta be careful. Um, and then they would make a new copy, a, a revised copy with everyone's comments, and then mail those out. Now it's all digital. You know, it's it's instant. Um, meters. There's not only are there meters for just about everything that you can hold in your hand, but they're getting smaller, cheaper. They have telemetry. You know, I'm working on a, a lithium battery fire right now. And I have, I can get on my phone and I can look at what's the temperature, what's the humidity, what are the VOCs, what's the particulate levels at various size ranges. Right, in real time. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, when we have to do outdoor air quality and there's an evacuation, you know, you'd have to figure out what's the wind speed, wind direction. Now mm -hmm. we, just, we just drop a MET station and we know exactly the wind speed, wind direction. Not only at that moment, but we can do a 10 minute average. We can do a 24 hour average. We can do a 12 hour average. So the technology is is pretty amazing. You know, people worry that industrial hygienists will not be necessary in the future because the uh, you know you can just somebody can mail you an instrument, you can put it in your uh, building, and it'll tell you everything. There's still interpretation. That's you know, it. That, that's the thing. It's like you're not going to AI your way through this. <laughs> You're really not. I mean, maybe part of the data deciphering, and you know, and that sort of thing maybe can be AI, but there's still and there and there's this tactile thing, right? You, you, there's still the the client consultant, you know, or client contractor. There's there's things that you have to do, I think, person to person, right? When, right. Well, I think the key is uh, the takeaway for me is there's nothing that you or I are going to tell a client that they couldn't actually look up online. Most likely, they could find the standard. They could find how to do these samples. They could find ways to interpret them. But you know what you can do and what I can do? One, I can tell you what it means right now. I can tell you what applies to your building in that jurisdiction because it's different in Maricopa County than it is in Pinal County, right? Um, and based on experience, I can tell you here are the op here's the array of options at your disposal. And this one or these two are the best for your specific scenario, the time of year the type of population you have you know a school is different than a senior living facility which is different than a hospital which is different than a manufacturing facility and so that's where the expertise value will never be lost is being able to apply the information to that scenario absolutely well you're not going to get you're not going to get that degree of specificity on some boilerplate documentation that gets you know spit out you're just yeah. not you know, you're, you're, you know, you can't getting like a, just a bulleted list of, oh, it could be, you know, this, this, and this, that doesn't really fix, fix a, a situation for a client. So yeah. I, I, and, I, and we get a lot of internet experts now. They say, well, I read online this. And I go, okay, well, yeah, but have you considered these 50 things that I've been doing my whole life 
oh no, I didn't consider that. Well, that's why you, that's why you're paying me to tell right. you, you know? And, uh, but yeah, so there have been a lot of changes in the industry, um, you know, uh, but, and some are good and some are bad. You know, I'm an old school guy. Uh, I like to still get a check mailed to me. I don't like the the digital exchange of money. I like, um, you, you I like, like the tactile the feel of that check. I mean, yeah, I like to meet the client. I like to shake people's too. hand. Uh, I don't like virtual. I mean, this is an amazing technology. This tool we have, you know, we're we're a thousand miles apart or more. Oh, um, many thousands. You're we're in diagonally across the United States. Yeah, a couple thousand miles. So the but uh, so this makes that that communication feasible. But I would rather be sitting next to you, raising a glass, shaking your hand. Um, but we work with what we have and. Uh, you know, I'll probably see you at the IAQA meeting in Texas this year. I'm assuming. Uh, most likely. Uh, I, I, yeah, it, we'll we'll see. I actually I actually uh, have a uh, an abstract in with Susan. Uh, we we submitted one. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I haven't been there. For, haven't presented in a few years. Um, so we'll see. But I'll probably be there anyway. Uh, that's one of the things with Healthy Indoors. We we try to make the rounds of you know as many of them as we can get to. It, 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 but it is, you know, it's cost prohibitive. I can only be at so many conferences in a given year. So, I, you know, I have to pick and choose every year. But no, most no, likely. Do it. And, yeah, and that's going to be, that's in Austin this year, right? I believe it is in Austin, Texas. Yeah, yes, see, sir. That, that, and, and I think it's at the hotel right on 6th. So that kind of draws me, you know, 6th Street, Austin, you know. <laughs> Not hard. You don't have to twist my arm too hard to get there. Um, well, you know. So again, you know, your long perspective in this industry, is, you know, is is interesting, you know, because because again, you and I think we both had the opportunity to be here for a while and see trends and changes. And one of the things that you mentioned, you know, it, it, these cycles, you know, these different, you know, like whatever the uh, the problem du jour or the you know the focus du jour of the industry, um, it, it does open it does open the door to unproven technologies, unproven uh, service providers, um, because there's, especially, you know, I mean, the, the pandemic is a classic example of that, right? Because there's this crisis initially in early 2020, nobody's really sure what to do. We really don't know all the mechanisms and how the transfer and how, you know, how this virus becomes a, an illness, you know, um, right away. I mean, there was a lot, of, you know, a lot, a lot of different conflicting information coming out. So it opens the door for a lot of, you know, snake oil. I, the, oh, yeah. lack of a better oh, yeah. term. Or just, you know, I, I give a great example. Uh, you know, we design airborne infection isolation rooms. And uh, but just throwing up a sheet of plastic across the hallway is not making an isolation wing or an isolation room. you got to know you have to understand supply and return. Uh, for example, you know, you have to understand air movement in buildings. Uh, you know, I. Um, I have had COVID three times, uh, probably because I'm doing thousands and thousands of fit testing of people who are in healthcare, uh, and you're they're constantly breathing on your face because you're two inches from them when you're fit testing them. But um, I ended up in an airborne infection isolation room, and so from the patient perspective, I actually got to see what a bad design or a, and I would say a less than stellar design looked like. Right, so there was a, a negative air machine or a HEPA filtration device, AFD air filtration device, you pick your, you know, it depends what industry and what you call it. Yeah. But a HEPA filtered fan in my room, right next to my bed. And it was, one, it was very loud, all right? Two, it was pulling 500 CFM of air across my body 24 hours a day. So my skin was drying out, my eyes were drying out. I was cold when I didn't need to be cold, all right? Um, because you're in an isolation room, you're isolated. Uh, so I was not able to see anybody. Um, you know, I, I said, where's your, where's your a patient wellness program? Who, where's the rabbi or the priest or the social worker or the family member that's scheduled to call me once a day and say, hey, Bob, how, how are you? Not like physically, but like here and, and here, yeah. you know, and I speak respirator. I mean, I Seeing people in respirators my whole not my whole life, my whole career, right? So That's I'm not funny. afraid speaking, of people. Speaking respirators. of respirator, I love that. But these doctors would come in and you couldn't hear them right. and you couldn't see their expression. And I thought, what if I was a 70-year-old woman, um, you know, not not in the infection control business? Well, how would I feel about this? I would have been scared to death. 
Oh, it's that awful. Whole experience, you know, so with, you know, with these, these emerging pandemics, you know, they're going to continue to occur. The good news is the fundamentals that we, that we learn, that we use of isolation, of hygiene, of respiratory protection, they work. Even if you don't know what the goo is, if you know what the cootie, I like to use the term cootie, even if you know what the cootie is, there are certain things you can do or should do to protect yourself and the community you serve. As you learn more about the organism, you can fine tune that. Um, and maybe you make the wrong decision in the beginning. I, you know, I work in a lot of lawsuits and one of the best advice pieces I give to my customers or other consultants is write down what you know when you learned it. Because some other uh, opposing expert is going to be given a file and it's going to contain here's what happened and here's what they did. And they're going to say, ah, they shouldn't have done that. Well, yeah, that's easy for you to say because now you know all the facts. But you know what? Hour one, the client called and said we had one issue and they were wrong. And it was 10 issues and they were going to say it's one building and they were wrong. It was 10 buildings. Right. So, yeah, you know, what we did hour one was absolutely inadequate. But what's well, we a starting we, point? It, it, we this were, is it, this process is dynamic. <laughs> we don't we don't know the answers going in. Yeah. So you learn things and as you learn things, you modify. You know, I, I tell people all the time, make a decision. You may have heard me say this before. You know, don't stand in the crossroads, turn left, turn right, go backwards, go forwards, but don't, don't be paralyzed by analysis, move in a direction. It may be the wrong direction, but you're certainly not going to achieve any better outcome if you stand still. Uh, and that goes for active shooter, that goes for infection control, that goes for if you're walking across the street. <laughs> no, don't I get mean, run it, over in the crossroads. It, it makes total yeah. sense. It's it standing, you know, inaction is always wrong. <laughs> it's always the wrong move. Yeah, and I'm not saying knee jerk reactions are the way to go, but you know, to to not move. I, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, we don't want to do anything until we know everything." Well, there's a good chance we won't know everything right. ever. So, you know, I don't think doing nothing is the right choice. Mm -hmm. You know, and then and we're consultants. I mean. Uh, you know, we, we give advice. I, I was in a meeting. I was giving advice to a, I can't say who, but a large company. We'll just say a large company. I'm in a boardroom with a bunch of corporate muckety mucks. And they they called me there because someone did some Legionella testing. They found Legionella pneumophila in some of their water. And I said, well, it's detectable. It's not at a concentration above the commonly cited action level. I said, you should certainly improve your water quality. But I, you know, I don't think this is uh, an emergent you know, a situation, uh, we'll help you through it. We'll make a plan and we'll help you through it. And they said, no, no, we want to, we want to let our employees know. And I said, well, that's up to you, but I don't advise it because there's no reason to tell them one, it's very low concentration Two, There's no, you know, people get Legionnaires disease by inhaling water droplets. Nobody's inhaling water droplets in an office. It's not like they're taking showers or going in the spa at their office. But I said, you know, ultimately it's your decision. So they chose to, send out an email. They drafted it and sent it out. And within 10 minutes, there was a helicopter flying around the building. And it, it was a news. news, news of course. Yeah. Yeah. And the IT, they got the IT guy to come up and this is speaking to technology changes. The IT guy knew exactly when the email went out and exactly when that email was forwarded by who several people forwarded it to news outlets. And immediately it was, you know, company X has Legionella problem. Um, and I was like, oof, that's an I told you so moment. But yeah, again, I mean, I'm not saying they it, shouldn't have, you know, the, that was their decision to share. Sure, but, sure. Um, you know, the technology is different. And, uh, but we, we advise them and they either take that advice or they don't. Right. So in that case, they didn't. And, but that's the best you could do with your client. I mean, and I always say that too, like, you know, even, you know, schools, you know, they're, you're doing some sampling for mold or whatever. And I said, you, you before you, go down the path of doing sampling under, you know, what is your plan going to be if, if the results come back adverse? Right. Well, you know, and you know, there's always this attitude. We don't tell anybody. It's like, Oh no, it'll be discovered. It's like, if you, if you, if you take the samples, there's, you know, the, there's a chain of custody. This is very discoverable information. So you already need to think of how you're going to handle that worst case scenario. Right. You know, you, yeah. you should already have the mechanisms in place for this is our, this is our damage control. This is how we're going to, you know, this, we're going to say this, this, and this, and we're going to, you know, 
you know, this this could be our steps. But if you just go in there and just like, like in this case, you know, throw out the email and now what do you do? Right. Now you're in, now you're full blown crisis mode. Yeah. Knowing what you're going to do with the sample results is critical. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, because I'm involved in these organizations, I counsel a lot of my competition and, you know, one fella called me one day and he said, hey, I, I uh, went to this job and I smells like ammonia. I sampled TO15. Uh, you know, I took a aliquot of air, sent it to the lab, had TO15 analysis. I said, but you just said you smelled ammonia. He said, yeah. I said, well, TO15 is toxic organic 15. It, by definition, it has to contain carbon to be organic, right? So ammonia is NH3. It doesn't contain any carbon. You'll never find uh, ammonia if you do a TO15. And so, you know, that is one thing that we have to help continue to make our colleagues and ourselves better. Um, But then I said, and when you get a result, what are you going to say? You know, what's the uh, what's the the various levels of, oh, no, there's nothing to be done here. or Oh, no, we need to leave the building right now. I mean, you need to have that that discussion with your client before you collect any samples. I, I usually, I use the analogy because I've, I've testified in many trials. I've been deposed many times and uh, I, you know, there's a value to sampling, but sometimes you don't need to sample. Um, and if you do sample, you're, you're putting bullets into the gun of the plaintiff attorney or, you know, potentially so, you are. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, 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 and not that it's going to give you any positive outcome, you know, I mean, like if, you, if you're already going to go down the path of, you know, you know, you have a pretty good idea what the corrective measures are. Sometimes that analytical information at the onset is not necessarily what you want there. That's going to drive the show. I, sure. I, if you see visible mold growth in a building. Yeah. You, you there's a mold problem. Sample. There's a mold problem if there's mold on the wall. Yeah. If you take an air sample and it comes back balanced, are you going to say, go ahead and leave that mold there? Right. No. Right. So what's the, you have to, you know, I, I try to teach my team samples are help, are a tool to help you answer a question, ask the question and then find a way to answer it. If, if, if you need the sampling, you need the analytical to answer the question, then do it. But it, don't just sample for sampling sake. One, it, it wastes clients resources. We want to be good stewards of the funding of our clients, right? I mean, we're obviously in the business, so we want to make money, but we want a client for life and we want to give them a good value. Um, And then if you're not answering a question, sampling just can convolute things. Like I said, you know, if there's mold on the wall and you take an air sample and the air sample is balanced, you're still going to address the mold on the wall. So what value did it have? But you're going to have an argument, you're going to have an argument with somebody saying, maybe you don't need to, is there's no exposure, which is like, okay, now you get, now you're getting into like, you're creating situations that are not helping. (laughs) Yeah. It either is affecting the air, was affect the air or will affect the air and that makes uh you know a potential health risk so we're going to address the visible mold growth but yeah um yeah it's just, it's, it's, as a consultant I mean, do you find yourself being drawn into i mean I, you must uh, it, almost the spin control a lot of times right with with different entities when you know actually advising them and how they're going how they present the information so they don't create you know total hysteria and, and making things go you know explode when it's not necessarily warranted you know you don't need to evacuate the building you don't need to get this crazy well I, so try find- to, I try to use this analogy i say listen i so i have a i have an interview question and, and hopefully i don't embarrass myself or embarrass you but uh, what do you tell? What do you call someone who tells the truth ninety nine times out of a hundred? A damn liar. A damn liar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not telling and the truth. In our business, you have to be honest when right. it helps your client or if it buries your client. Our job is to to tell the truth, give accurate information, so people can make decisions. Sometimes the truth we provide is expensive and uncomfortable for right. our client. But it's so important because if you don't get it right, everything you've done previously comes into question. Everything you do in the future will come into question. So that's the most important thing is to to be honest. I don't know is an acceptable answer, right? I don't know. Uh, People say, but you're supposed to know. Well, no, nobody knows everything. And you, and you, you can't, there's no way to have every piece of data. You're still making, you're, you're, you're making, generalizations you know and you, you have to i mean because you, you have there's missing pieces in every puzzle when you do a, a, an investigation you don't have them all 
Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's, that's, you know, mission critical is giving good information and then answering the question and what your client does with it sometimes is, you know, it's, it's, it's not what you would expect or not what right. you think they should do. But again, that's ultimately it's their choice. I mean, if they're doing something that's illegal or I think someone's going to get killed, I will put my foot down. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I like to tell people what I want is credibility. Mm-hmm. I want to say, Hey, Bob, you know what? You need to burn that building to the ground. I just want you to reach in your pocket for a lighter and hit it, right? Or if I say, hey, Bob, you know what? It's all good. I want you to walk away satisfied. That, But the credibility I want is not blind credibility. I want the credibility of Derek looked at all the options. He looked at all the available information. He's weighed it and applied it to our situation, and he's made a recommendation. And we can we can hang our hat on that recommendation. Um, based you know, on your experience and, and, and expertise, that's yeah. why they hire you. So, but yeah, when you tell them to burn the building down, sometimes it's bad news, right? But, um, I'm, I've never told anybody to burn the no, building no, down. I, We're I, talking I, things I, like, you know, evacuate yeah. the building, yeah. right? Uh, or vacate the building. Uh, that's a pretty tall ask. You know, I had an, actually a, a client where they had got a white powder in the mail and a death threat. And they thought it was potentially anthrax. So they called us out. And uh, I said, you should evacuate the building. I said, you don't know if it's anthrax or not. I said, well, either do you. You know, so. (laughs) Right. And that that was when that all was going on, the anthrax scare stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like you don't know. I mean. I said, so what do you want to do? I mean, out of an abundance of caution, I would evacuate the building. They chose not to. And I wrote them a letter that said, you know, we're severing our relationship with you because we've advised you to do something. That we think is important and you're choosing not to do it. You know, um, it was not anthrax, turns out. But again, I don't know at hour one, you right. know. So, yeah, you have to sometimes make make tough decisions. But it's always interesting. You know, a guy was making ricin in his apartment. And I don't think he was looking for the next cure for cancer. Probably not. Probably not. So, so we get called on some pretty exotic jobs that's kind of what clark safe clark is known for is the other there's lots of folks that can do an asbestos survey for you there's not a lot of lithium battery fire uh folks out there you know mm-hmm. but um but yeah it is definitely always an interesting interesting ride so i uh, you know again uh you know clark safe clark where you've been for many years and you know since since you actually since you got in this uh, indoor environmental industry right is that is that where you started? Uh, no, I didn't start oh, there. Sorry. I I'm started so with CSC in 2000, but I worked okay. for several environmental consulting firms and a national uh, abatement firm prior to that. And uh, I ended up landing at CSC in January 5th of 2000 and have been there ever since. Uh, I worked in their Los Angeles area office and then I moved to Phoenix, got married and moved to Phoenix and opened the office here. And, uh, yeah, it's been a good, it's been a good ride. You know, I mean, there are many iterations of a happy life that you could have, you know, Absolutely. I don't know, uh, but, um, you know, I've never missed a meal and I'm, I'm generally healthy knock on wood and I try to have a work life balance. You know, you do all the things you can to, I tell people that, uh, you know, I turned 50, I wrote a book. I didn't, it's not a book for sale. I just wrote a book, um, uh, and I gave it to people at my birthday party. And the theme of the book, basically, Bob, is uh, whatever it is you think you need to do with your life, you, you should get busy doing that because no tomorrow is promised. And there's no sexy way to take off your socks. So that's oh, kind of the boy. Point. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, Der- Derek, and uh, at Sewer Gas Solutions, you know, your, your new or evolving product that you you know you, it's, it's it's been a decade almost in the, the work's getting here but um you know a great solution uh seems to be something that's uh very well needed uh and again find out more about that at sewergassolutions.com and i'm even throwing up your little email too so they could reach out mm-hmm. to you if they would like to and uh yeah so this uh, this has been great we ran out of time you know as we always do this is i well i knew this in our pre-show i said this I, there's no way I, i'm going to feel cheated after after 60 minutes regardless because there's just there's too much to speak with you about so we have to have you back on again well anytime but it's always a pleasure i appreciate what you do the industry should appreciate what you do 
you know, you're a staple and I, and it's a uh, staple. I'm like <laughs> rice and beans, <laughs> the rice and beans of indoor air quality. Well, well I, I mean, that's, mean, that's better than calling me the Ryan Seacrest of indoor environmental stuff because I'm, I'm heading down that path. That? Yeah. I've heard it three times this week and it's really starting <laughs> to worry me a little bit because, uh, you know, that's not necessarily a positive connotation. I don't know. Um, He's very successful. At what well, he yes, he yes, yes. It. But you know, I don't know it, Ryan, but I, I don't, uh, I don't either. Know. But he either. seems to he seems to be doing whatever it is he wants to do. Exactly, exactly. So anyway, Derek Denay, uh always a pleasure to speak with you. Hope we get to see each other uh, in person soon. I mean, you know, at some industry event. Uh, it's been too long. It's been wait, I look wait forward to long. shaking your hand, my friend. I look exactly. I, I I will do that too. So um, we'll be back again next week. Um, we're uh, next Thursday. Uh, we actually uh, have a taped, a pre-recorded show with Charlie Wiles, who's the founder of ACAC, and we'll be talking a little bit about some of the stuff that he's done. He's been around a long time in the industry too, and really looking forward to uh, sharing that that show with you. Uh, also, wanted to remind everyone that, of course, we are, um, you know have launched a long time ago the healthy indoors uh global online community um and uh we uh you know you can get to that at global.healthyindoors.com um many of you are watching the show there now if you're not it's a great place to go you should go to the community um it'll give you the op opportunity to um network with other people like minds around the world in your industry in uh, other silos, the indoor environmental industry. Um, we have a ton of free public access content like this show and many other shows, but uh, so much more if you actually become a full-fledged member of the community. So highly recommend you do that. Um, we'll see you again next Thursday. Uh, same bad time, same bad channel here for the uh, Healthy Indoors live show. Until then, I'm Bob Krell. Stay healthy and stay safe.